It's me and you, and this is how it's going to work. Then build me a sanctuary. Um, speak to the children of Israel, build me a sanctuary. So they are in a new context, and in that new context, a new structure of their family life, a, a new structure of their business life had to be now established. And the core and the foundation of that new structure was this sanctuary now needed to be built. And God says, if you build that sanctuary, and then I will be among you. I'll dwell among you. I will be the reason behind your progress and your, pro and your, and your success. I'll be the reason behind your health and strength. I'll be the reason behind the growth of your family life. I'll be the reason behind the physical healing of your bodies. I'll be healing behind your, the social structure of your life. But you need to build me a sanctuary out of your offerings. And I'll give you the pattern of the things. So we understand by this scripture, when you move into a new place with God, there's a new structure that needs to be in place. And that becomes very critical. When God came to us and introduced us to himself, he shifted us to a different place. The Bible says he plucked us out of the kingdom of darkness and put us into the kingdom of his dear son. That's a different place. And there, in that place, we can only thrive in the context of our new existence by a new st structure. A new place in God desires or requires a building of a relevant structure. It could be a new season. It could be God moving us to a different season that he explains and defines. In that, then we need the wisdom to know I can operate by the same mentalities and behaviors that I had in the previous season. Now that God is bringing me into this new place, I need a new way of operating. Amen. So that's what this statement means. To thrive in the context in which I exist with God requires building a structure that is relevant to that structure, to that, to that, to that, to that place. If, if I'm a young person and I decide to get married in the Lord, I move out of a single life to a married life, that will need a different structure in my personal life itself to have a very different way of operating because I'm taking a new position in God that for me to thrive in it, I have, it's a must that I should build a new structure from God that's relevant to that new season in our lives. So this is applicable at every stage of our walk with God, and we need grace to be able to walk in these things. And obviously the enemy being a spirit being, he understands this very, very well, that somebody could be a new context with an old structure and will never function, and wonder why is God not working? Because you're in a new context, but you didn't change your clothes. You're still wearing the same old clothes of the previous season. But this season has a different values, different principles, different things are going on here. You need to undress yesterday's way of thinking and behaving. You have to put on a new man for this context so that we can thrive in that. So the enemy just makes us think, I'm born again. With my born again structure, I can go through every other season the same way. That's not true. Every season demands a new structure to be built. Hence, we always pray for God to give us sight. DNW says God showed him that scripture in Ephesians, uh, chapter 1, 16, I think, uh, that the, 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 the Lord of glory should give us the spirit of wisdom in the knowledge of him. And he says God asked him, to whom was this scripture written? And he says it dawned to him, it was written to the born again children of God. And he says, therefore, it's possible to be born again and be blind. And God says, you must pray that your eyes be enlightened, that you may have understanding, because it is possible to be born again and still remain blind. So we really need God to open our eyes, especially as we move one season after the other, because we have to always re reshape, recalibrate, rechange, redress for the right season, uh, uh, that is coming ahead of us. Winter is going to come very soon. None of us will be dressed the way we are today. You'll see serious jackets coming out of the wardrobe. 
during winter time. Because seasons have changed. Even in the spirit, we need the grace of God to open our eyes. Not to walk by the same born again, me, 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 born again, born again, me praying, me fasting, me doing this. When there's a new context, it demands a shift in a structure that needs to be built. Right from my way of thinking, you know, uh, God has to build a new structure. So a new place in God requires um, a development of an appropriate structure. Are we good with that part? Amen. Therefore, we can say the speaking of God is intended and directed to establishing the required structure. Acts 20, 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is the one that builds us up. And I'm saying the speaking of God is intended and it's actually directed uh, to building the structure that is required. Didn't we say God, God, God builds everything by wisdom? So God is wise and in his wisdom he knows if I want to flow life um, to, to KG for that matter, Huputso, uh, this life I need to flow to him requires a new structure to be built. Then God can't just give the life when he knows life is a simple outflow of a structure established. Then it means whenever God preaches, first thing he goes for is build a structure so we can access the life of that which is building. And I'm saying in this year we need to journal. Take note of what is God saying because in his wisdom, whatever he's going to be saying moving forward from now, it's targeting areas that needs to be built in us so that we can thrive in the new season that is bringing our way. But if we can take note of what God said, what God said, what God said, what God said, our family structure may now face a pressure that if we did not build according to the speaking of God, we might actually fail. Because we did not realize when God was speaking, he was trying to build us to thrive in a new season of our family life, or our marriage life, or our business life, or your, your existence in your, in your studies, wherever you go. Whatever God is going to say this year, we need to pay serious attention Take note of it. Identify the things he's trying to establish in my heart so that I can build these different components that are coming from the word of God and be able to thrive in this 2024 as God is defining it to us as a different season than 2023 was. So the speaking of God, because God is wise, will therefore be directed to, to just building us because his word builds us to access the life that he wants us to have. So I need to pay attention. If it's okay, I will be in prayer throughout. I'll carry the word of God in prayer. I'll carry the word in worship. I'll carry the word in the responsibilities we have in the house of God, but also stay alert and awake. What is he saying to me? What is God trying to build in my heart? What is God trying to build in my marriage? What is he saying about my marriage? What are the things he wants me to build as a husband? What are the things he wants me to build as a wife? What are the things he wants me to build as a child in a family? What are the things that God is trying to build for our family? That could be a family-wide discussion. God is speaking this way. It affects us as a family structure. We need to be built by the speaking of God so that we can thrive in the context that is bringing our way. So if God builds everything by wisdom, therefore he speaks wisdom. And if he speaks wisdom, first thing you'll target is structure your heart. I'm about to do something. But your heart is not in the right place. It can't receive what I have for you. So the first thing God will do is prepare our hearts to can receive what he wants. By this we then understand the scripture about new wine and new wineskins. Because the Bible says uh, 
in Luke 5, 36, 38. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece, and uh, this is Jesus speaking, no one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, a, a tear. And also, the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined themselves. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So because of God's wisdom, we understand why this scripture was given to us. New capacity and functionality of God cannot be given unless the structure is changed. Jesus has come, it's a new season. It's a season of being born again, and he has to give the Holy Spirit who then enables us to function in this new life. But if we're not born again, it's not going to happen. So you see even that, God will have to focus on rebuilding our structure for us to be able to thrive in the new season. New wine can only be poured into new wine skins, not the old. And it says both will be preserved. And I find a very interesting uh, uh, issue here that Jesus reveals uh, when he called Peter, um, Luke 5, 4 to 6. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great, a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So Jesus uh, demonstrated to Peter to say, uh, a new season over his life had come. Christ has come, but he did not have the capacity to receive what comes from God. Because remember, when God releases a blessing, uh, it's at the level of God. It's not at our level. It's possible that God could open someone's business, but you don't have the capacity to handle that. Because whenever God opens, he doesn't open at our level. He opens at his level. Things just roll. Things just move faster beyond our capacity to can even manage. And it is there that we really need the grace of God to have that. And then Jesus is demonstrating to Peter, so, okay, at my word, you, you take the same capacity you think you have, throw it in, and when he caught he caught according to the visitation of God, and he did not have the capacity. He didn't even take any one of that, of that fish. Again, Christ was demonstrating that when God comes and visits us, he visits us with abundance of life. The question could be, do we have the capacity or not? And God knows already, we don't have the capacity. So Jesus knew they would not be able to drag that fish out. But he needed to demonstrate when God comes, first thing first, his capacity must be developed. And then immediately he shifts Peter, right, to the spiritual principle. He shows, he demonstrates in the physical that when God arrives, you don't have the capacity to carry God. So he needs to first work on you so you can walk with God in a new season. You don't enter a new season with old mentalities. Do me that favor because the enemy will always beat us if we don't understand that. So he takes Peter and shows him that you are moving from one context to a new context. Just as I demonstrated, you would need a new, a new structure. Verse 10 and 11. Um, and so also when, where James and, and John, the sons of Zebedee, uh, where James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, and Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. I, I can imagine the other uh, fishermen there, they said, these guys, this is what we've been waiting for, such a huge catch. This is big business stuff, and these guys just left everything and followed Christ. And this is the issue. The context in which Peter, James, and John will actually now exist was no longer being fishermen, but apostles of Christ. He had demonstrated, when I come, new structure, new capacity needs to be built. A new context is defined. He defines a new context for them. Forget about fishing. I'm sending you now as disciples 
into the kingdom of God. In that, you will need a new heart. You will need a new way of thinking. You will need a new way of, of, of living. There has to be poured into you spiritual resource that we call anointing. The Holy Ghost will have to come upon you, but do not be afraid. You may not have had capacity to deal with the fish, but with the new context, don't be afraid. I will help you build the capacity to walk with God. Amen. Jesus himself was fully and completely invested in developing the structure and capacity of his function as a priority. 30 years versus 3 years of functionality. For 30 years, the Bible says he grew, um, Luke 2.40, and the child grew and worked strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. You know, it's almost like when we enter a new season, first things first, because a new capacity must be built. We have to be shifted into spiritual activities that we know uh, stretches us and builds new things in us. For example, daily prayer. Engaged in daily prayer. Because you can tell I'm in a new season and I know I will have to be able to thrive in this new season, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, so we have to call on God so that spiritually we, 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 we are built and sometimes a worry life, when we are worried a lot about things, it, it may be an indication of uh, less activities or rather accurate activities of the spirit uh, that takes away the worry. You know, uh, I won't explain much about that, but Jesus works strong in spirit. How do you work strong in spirit without being prayerful, without being filled with the word? It's impossible. He didn't work strong physically. He didn't go to a physical gym. The Bible says he works strong in spirit. And things of spiritual exercise are prayer. <laughs> like daily prayer, like continuous prayer. And seeking the word to be life to me. Not reading Bible stories, but the word to be life to me. Someone say amen to that. He works strong in spirit. So we, we need a, a strong spiritual life. You know, we need strong spiritual activities going on here. Yeah, I might be running a business, so therefore I need to be one hour early. In that one hour early, I'm in that office. I'm waxing strong in the spirit. I've got scriptures that speaks about business being held and sustained by God. I'm entering into a new context of marriage as a young person I need to find scriptures that empowers me about marriage and then get into prayer so that I can work strong in the process. So he works strong in spirit. The Bible says filled with wisdom. Remember, wisdom flows out of the revelation of the word of God. Amen. So that's how I know he was filled with the word for he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Verse 52 also says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. We need practical wisdom, amen? And in favor with God and men. That's a powerful thing. So this is before he could even function. He grew in favor with God. So much favor with God. He sought the favor of God before he could even go and function. And some of us usually, we jump to function <laughs> before we build strength to have favor with God, to be spiritually strong for the new assignment that is ahead of us. We get a job, we get too excited about the job, and it's a good thing to be excited about a job, but first thing first, we need to build stru structure to sustain ourselves in that job because we're going to be opposed. Some people won't like the fact that we've been favored. They will say all kinds of negative things. They look down upon us, and some will withhold information that they need to share with us so that we also shine in the job. So first thing first, bless God, we're excited, but then now let's work in favor with God. We, 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 like I said, some of you may have to go to work earlier than everybody else and ask for the wisdom of God to be sustained in this blessing that came by God. I cannot just go in because God has given me a job and then everything will be fine. No, there's going to be, there's going to be war. The enemy would want to embarrass you. The enemy would want to prove you were the wrong employee. You shouldn't have gotten the job. So instead of just dealing with this thing from a technical human point of view, you go early in the morning, knock off after every gym and jack is gone, and still pray for God to can hold you in this new context, give you wisdom. 
and give you favor like Christ had. And therefore, that is waxing in spirit. And you'll be praying and, and, and doing all these things. Even when people fight you at work, you're spiritually very strong. You can handle it. Everything that comes from God can only be sustained in God and by the activities of waxing strong in spirit and in the favor of God. So instead of trying to calculate three years, four years down the line, let's deal with tomorrow morning. Enter the context of a blessing with prayer. Lord, you've brought me into a new place. Lord, I feel I'm still in an old place. I want to enter the new. We enter there in prayer. We enter there seeking the word that will speak and fill us with the wisdom of God. 30 years, um, Jesus' life was focused on growing, developing. And only three years, he functioned and he succeeded and finished everything. Our prayer for the gift of a heart that has eyes to see and ears to hear, according to Proverbs 20.12, is to enable us to perceive the instructions of the Lord carefully directed and sequenced for inner divine structure development. For us to hear God, so that I can see this thing that God is saying fits here in my heart. To put it in the right place. It's a brick being placed in that its right position for a building of my heart. So when we pray for eyes to see and ears to hear, it's so that we can tell this speaking of God, you understand what I'm saying because sometimes you can sit under the weight for, the, for a very long time and remain weak and unproductive. When pressure comes, you can't stand. But God has been preaching for probably 12 months. But you still cannot even find even the slightest strength to deal with the challenges in your marriage or in your business or your studies that faces you because we were not able to tell. As God was preaching, probably our minds were wondering. Because the Bible says when the word of God is being preached, the enemy comes quickly to steal the word. So hence I say this year, we honestly need to have physical journals. Even if it's a, I don't know these books you guys buy. During our time, they were called hard choir. <laughs> I don't know why that book was called hard choir. What do you call those books now? It's still called hard choir. One choir, two choir. One choir. How can we have a one choir? Choir is many people. Anyway, those books. Even if it's an ordinary book, we need to track the speaking of God because it's going to build us for us to thrive in 2024. We can't fail by the end of 2024. And the only way we will fail is we never tracked what was God saying to me. Well, what were the things that God was challenging in my heart as this word was coming? What is it that was trying to shape in my heart? And you can tell this is a personal journey, right? Everybody must track for themselves. Amen? Very, very important this year. So we need eyes and ears uh, to see and to hear so that the instructions of the Lord that are carefully directed and sequenced for our inner development, we can pick them up. This week, this month, these are the areas God says I should work on. And they're very practical issues. But you know, when the miracle comes, it comes huge. You just act on ordinary practical things that look so simple, but they carry so much weight in the spirit. It's like simple things of obeying God in finances. They look simple. But I tell you, when God then comes, he comes with a, a massive miracle that doesn't make sense. Um, and that's the mystery of walking with God. I mean, really, uh, you just seem to be walking up and down, doing something called prayer. But somehow in the spirit, it just unlocks a whole lot of other amazing things that deals with powers that you could not even imagine how to deal with them. But just praying every single day over an issue, and God delivers a miracle. All our activities that might look simple and natural, they carry a backup from God if they are done in obedience to the will of God. Are we good with that? 
Proverbs 4.20, my son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. And this is how we're going to journal the speaking of God. Ezekiel 11, 19 to 20, he says, and I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I mean, there's hope for every one of us. I mean, if God speaks like this, there's hope for everyone. <laughs> he says, I'll give you singleness of heart. So if I have a wandering heart, I can come before God. He'll give me a straight heart, single you know, uh, singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them, a new spirit within them. He says, I'll take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws because a new heart has been delivered. They'll be my people and I'll be their God. This whole issue of new covenant, it's God changing my, my stubborn heart, you know, my inflexible heart my wandering heart, or too many options of living. And God says, I'll come and give you a single heart, singleness of heart, and I'll put a new spirit within you. No matter how hardened your heart might, might have been because of life experiences, God says, I can give you a great heart that is responsive to my will. Responsive to my will. Someone say responsive to my will. Now think of it this way, right? The Bible says, this is the day that the Lord has made, correct? Now this supernatural God made a natural day. But there's nothing natural about this day. It may just look like it is. But there's really not, nothing natural about the light we have. There's a power that manages the light we see outside. And that's the power of God. Things are hanging in the air without strings. There's a power that was created to keep them in position so they don't even collide. I mean, earth can't collide with the sun. Imagine if that were to happen. It would be chaotic. This is the day that the Lord has made. There's so much spiritual about this day. A whole lot of spiritual things have, have decided the, 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 the one second after 12 midnight to be a new day. And the one second before 12 midnight to be the end of that day. Everything is spiritual. You understand that? And therefore, we can expect to walk in that which is supernatural on a day. Because this is a supernatural existence called a day. It's created by a supernatural being. I can expect supernatural things to take place in it. Amen. And one of those things is that in this day, my heart can be made responsive to the things ordained by God. The things ordained by God for today, my heart can be made to see them and then respond to them the way I should respond to them. Because there'll be a lot of activities that happens today and in that God expects a heart that can respond according to his will. God can build my heart that way. So I can wake up in the morning and desire that this day that was made by a supernatural God, that is whose DNA in itself is supernatural. It's not calendar. The DNA of a day is not human calendar. It's supernatural. Hence, nobody can convince me today is Sunday. I beg to differ. You cannot tell me today is Sunday by your own calendar. Because God came to Israel at some point, we don't even know what calendar day that was. He says, today shall be your day one. What day was it? When God came to them and said, today, because I have done this for you, you shall commemorate it as first month, first day of the month. Somewhere in the middle of town or time, God called the first day. So the Jewish calendar itself, it's never accurate anyway to whatever, to, to when things began with God. When God created, he said it's the first day. And God created it was the second day. The night and the day was the first day. That date, nobody knows. The Jewish one, God decided one day and said, today you shall call this day first day. It's in relation to the move of God, not to the calendar of men. So don't tell me today we are worshiping a God of the sun because it's not Sunday today. According to your calendar, it might say Sunday. It's not Sunday today. And those who worship God on a Saturday, it's not Saturday at all. It could be a Wednesday. And you're so convinced you are worshiping God on a Saturday. Your calendar is it's missing even a lot of days, by the way. 
The calendar itself, it's, it's just out of sync with nature. Calendar is out of sync with science. And scientific people know that. That the human calendar that says today is Saturday, is three days behind. Yeah? It's three days behind. So everything about the day, its DNA is not calendar. The DNA of a God of the day is, this is the day that the Lord has made. Period. That's it. Doesn't matter what day it is. It's the day of the Lord. The DNA of my day is God. And I expect to be led in it. I expect things to fall in, in line for my favor. It's a day of God. This day is a day of God. Tomorrow is a day of God. And I expect supernatural things to take place to favor the will of God in my life. It is a day of God. It's a day God created. Amen. There's not even one calendar that tells us when, when, when will be the last day of earth to exist. It doesn't, it's only God who will just decide, oh yeah, today is the last day, boom, everything is gone. No human calendar can say that. So while it's still day, all we know is today's day carries supernatural DNA from God. I expect the spiritual world to favor the will of God in my life. And I walk in that faith. And we walk in that faith. Practical wisdom. Solomon, one of the guys that we know in scripture, that the Bible says was given wisdom such that no one before his birth would ever experience or had that wisdom. And no one after him will have that wisdom, of course, except Christ himself, who is the wisdom. First Kings 3, 5-9. to At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask, what shall I give you? You know, when this thing of in a dream just, just messed me up, uh, it, just, it, just, it just caused such a stir inside my system. In a dream. How many of us in a dream, you, you eat things you don't want to eat. You have no control of it. You go to places you don't want to go. You dream things you don't want to dream. In a dream? You have no control of what happens in a dream, except Solomon. And God knew this guy would respond right, in a dream. So God came to him in a dream, knowing that he will respond right, although he's unconscious. The guy will speak right. Amen? I don't know any one of you who ever spoke Chinese in a dream. But... <laughs> And then Solomon said, you have shown, I mean, really? In a dream, this guy is speaking in a dream. He says, you have showed great mercy to your servant, David, my father. Have you noticed that this sounded like he was not in a dream? He was not unconscious. No, but he was unconscious. And he's, he's giving a full account. He starts with history. You have shown great mercy to your servant, David, my father. Because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him. And you have given him a son to sit on his throne. As it is this day. Somebody see a structure of talk there? This guy is very structured. He's not haphazard. God says, okay, what can I do for you? Say, oh, Lord, hey, what can you do for me? If you can just give me, a, <laughs> you know, I need a business, I need a house. I No, he has order. He's got structure in a dream, unconscious. He's very structured, unconscious. That should change me in a big way. Lord, may <laughs> in my dream, let my spirit be active and full of life that I can engage with God in my dream by my spirit, not by my psychology, but by my spirit. And he says, now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. Favorite line of my life for this year. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant wisdom or an understanding heart. Another translation calls an understanding heart a heart that is teachable. 
a heart that hears when you speak. That's what it means in an understanding heart. In other words, make my heart ready and active to receive instructions how to go in and how to come out. Give me an understanding heart. He was not saying, uh, make me understand 10 years from now what will happen. He was saying, in year 10, let my heart still be responsive to your requirements that I don't even know what they will be like 10 years from now. Give me an understanding heart. Are we flowing together there? Is it your prayer for, to, for this year? Give me an understanding heart to judge your people that I may descend between good and evil. For who is able to judge these great people of yours? Who is able? Now let's look at a few things there. So the delivery of practical wisdom gives us the capacity to build God's temple and, and also operate this temple. The delivery of practical wisdom will, will give us the ability to build this structure that is responsive to the context that God is going to send us and place us in as individuals, but together as KCA. Practical wisdom gives us ability to build what is needed for the time. So when we are asking God for practical wisdom, we are saying to him, cause me to see instructions that build my life and my heart for where you are and I am with you in this season. And, 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 uh, and therefore, uh, these, uh, this wisdom has to rest upon a particular platform uh, that needs to be built in our hearts that we can learn from Solomon. Number one, out of Solomon, he understood his spiritual history. The grace that brought him to this point, he says, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father. I am standing here as a result of the mercies of David, not, not, not mine. He had that knowledge of what brought him where he was. What brought you and me where we are today? How did we end up here? Can we be able to tell the God of our journey? Can we tell the God who has worked with us in the previous years? And we need to be able to connect that. Awareness of, I'm here by a particular grace that I can define. I can tell how God brought me to where I am. I can tell how God made me survive everything that I never thought I would. And hence it becomes such a powerful thing before we pray about the future to always tell, tell God about the past. I am so grateful for having brought me this far. You see that corner, Lord, if you did not hold my hand, I would not have made it. You know, if you never saved me, I would have long messed up my family. My wife would be a crying woman, probably now divorced because of not knowing God. But because of your salvation, she has a husband today. It's nothing else but God saved me. Salvation preserved me. It kept me a husband, even when my everything did not want to be a husband. But salvation kept me a husband. Lord, that was you. That's my spiritual history. I am not here by my strength. I'm not here because my wife still likes me. Oh, Lord, probably she no longer likes that she saw in me. But your grace has kept my marriage till this day. This man in his unconsciousness could narrate to God his spiritual history before he tells God the future. He could tell God, you brought me here. <laughs> you brought me here. That David, my father, if you did not give him mercy, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'm a king because of your grace over my father. In his dream. So this practical wisdom needs to find a heart that is willing to trace God to where we are. And give honor to the God who has brought us to where we are. That heart is very, very important. While you're driving your car, exercise 
and practice this gratefulness of your past history and present it to God. I'm so grateful I'm standing today because of this spiritual history you've given unto me. So that heart is key for wisdom to sit upon. A heart that can acknowledge the hand of God in my life. Knowing and owning up my own personal truth. Acknowledgement of a context foreign to my humanity. You know, he says, I don't know how to go in and how to come up. You know, some of us think we know. Just because I'm a preacher now, I think I know. But the truth of the matter is, I don't know how to run this church. I need to own that. I don't know how to make this thing a church. I honestly don't. I don't know how to speak a word that helps you. There are so many challenges that are looking at me now. I would not even know how to help you unless God speaks. I don't know, but I need to own up to that. When I stand here, I need to own up to that. I don't know how to minister to your people. People might say I have a gift. I don't know that's them, but for me, I know. I don't know who is going to be sitting there listening to me and what's their problem. And they're asking for your help. I don't know how to speak to them. Solomon accepted. I don't know how to go in. I don't know how to come out. In other words, I don't know how to be a pastor. I don't know how to give people life. I don't know how to speak your word that delivers people. I don't even know who to pray for and say what. I can come here and think now I know and say, hey, you, you, come here, come here, come here, come here. That's pride. You can't give life. Only God gives life. And that is full in the church today. Because we are pastors, we think we know. We think we can tell you when to fall and when not to fall and your things will be fine. Back home, things are still not fine. Because we don't have the power to give life but God. Solomon said, your servant does not know how to go in, how to come out. How to be Mamfundis? She doesn't know. Unless God moves, she will never be. Owning up to personal truth. And I call it personally here um, in that statement, acknowledgement of a context that is foreign. This thing of God is foreign to humanity. Nobody knows how to do a God thing. Nobody. It's called marriage, and that thing comes from God. It didn't come from our culture. Nobody knows how to do marriage, and we need to own up to that, especially men. We don't know how to be men. Only God does. I can tell you now, we don't know. Whatever we are doing is not God. It's us. It's not God. But a heart that will walk in practical wisdom must accept. Even to be human, I actually don't know. I didn't create myself. So therefore, I don't have a manual of creating myself. That explains why my eye is the way it is. I don't have a manual for that. Only the one who created me knows what it is to be human. Your servant does not know how to go in or how to come out. I can't explain my body. Only you know. Instead of being arrogant and think we understand who we are, those who walk in practical wisdom will accept the truth. Acknowledgement of a context of, be, of this life being foreign to humanity in general, I do not know how to go out or how to come in. That's First King 3, uh, verse 7. Solomon accepted that. The, th the third thing that we can learn from Solomon who had wisdom is awareness of the context that defines his life. He said, you have placed your servant you have made your servant king instead of my father. You have made your servant king instead of my father. Awareness of the context that now defines him. I was an ordinary Solomon, but now you've made me king. I have a new context. I need a new structure. 
What's the context that God has placed you and me in right now? Who are we? You have called me to be a child of God. I was an ordinary person who would have done things the ordinary way, the human way, but now I'm called a child of God. Lord, I need a structure to live as a child of God. I don't know how to do that. But at least I recognize I'm in a new place. I am a child of God and God called me to be a pastor. This is different for me. I need awareness of my position. What does it mean to pastor you? You know? What's this position all about? And I need him to define it for me properly. Lest I define it by what I think it is and make a mess out of it all at the end of the day. So Solomon was aware of the context that defined him. I need to be aware of the context that defines me. Correct? So me and Hans can go to a stadium and watch Bafana Bafana and whoever. But the context that, I, that defines me and the context that defines Mr. Mangole is different. We are in the same stadium. I'll have to behave differently to him because of my context. And I need to be aware of that. Yeah? <laughs> Solomon was aware of the context that defined him. He was in a different place. So even if he went to a restaurant like everybody else, he had to go there as a king, aware of the call of God, not of the title, but the call of God and the requirements for that office. That if I'm robbed of a change in a restaurant as Solomon, I cannot argue and fight, you know, just like favor fighting for his change. Me, I have a different context. I might as well overlook an issue for the sake of the call of God in my life. For the sake of the call, I might as well let it slide. I may be offended and feel I have a right to defend myself, but because maybe of the context of being a child of God in the midst of these people, I might as well choose to be a little bit of a fool in, the front, in front of the people, but I'm trying to protect the call of God in my life never to be found uh, responding in emotions. Practical wisdom needs us to be aware of the context that defines us. Practical wisdom sits upon a platform where a heart is aware. I carry God. I need to represent God. I carry God. Well, every student is in class, uh, like Shengeleti, we said I must give Tuli a break. So Shengeleti, you are next. <laughs> but her context of being in class is different from everybody else because she's a child of God. She's aware of that. So wisdom rests upon a heart that is aware of the context that defines our lives right now. Make sense? We go to that? The Bible says we are in the world, but we are not of the... So when we are in this world, we don't behave like everybody else in the world because we are not of the world by Christ, yet we are still in the world. So the way we handle ourselves in this world should tell whose we are and whom we, we represent. Yet we are still down here in the world. Someone say amen to that. You know that very well. When you come out of church and go out there, you'll see the world, right? It's always in your face. People leave the world. You see it. How they live it. How they dress it. How they eat. How they drink. How they relate. It's just right in front of you. But that's not our world. We have a different civilization. Practical wisdom rests upon a heart that is aware of the context that defines our existence, being children of God. We can live in the world, not necessarily 
be touched by the world, but live our own. And the Lord should help us so that we can walk in wisdom. Issuing a proper demand or asking the right thing. Issuing a proper demand of sight and praying according to the context that shapes my priorities. Asking the right thing from God. That's issuing a proper demand of the context that shapes my priorities. Asking the right thing. That's another way of putting it. When God came to him, he understood his context and therefore he asked the right thing. Asking the right thing before God flows from understanding the context in which I live with him. So I ask the right thing. Amen. Practical wisdom needs a heart that will issue out a proper demand. Now, to issue out these proper demands means we need to be filled with the word and the Lord will help us do that throughout this year. Amen, saints. So we are in a place where we desire uh, that God should build us to thrive in 2024. Build us to see things we have not been able to see for many years finally come to pass. First thing first, God will change our hearts. He'll change our hearts. As he changes our hearts, he will be speaking Sunday after Sunday. Pay attention. Your breakthrough, it's in the speaking of God. God speaks targeted to changing my heart so that I can thrive in 2024. How many are ready for the instructions of God? They'll be very direct. Nobody should push them away. God will speak so direct to each one of us' heart, including me. He'll speak so straight. He'll speak directly to things if I can hear them and, and implement them in my heart. I would be prepared to can thrive in this year and come with a different testimony at the end of the year. Amen. So we are ready to receive from God. And uh, we have our heart choirs. Uh, we're going to journal the speaking of God. We'll look at it carefully. God said this last Sunday. This is what it meant for me. This is how it challenged my thinking and behavior. It, this is how it challenged the company that I'm keeping or friends. I think I need to leave that group. <laughs> you see the tracking right there, you know. I may like them or not, that's not the issue. It's this way God of talking says, I'm getting defiled because of the friends I keep. So um, I'm leaving them. You know. So we track all these things that God is going to be saying. God emphasized to me that pray daily, pray daily. I need you to pray daily. I need you to create an altar. Pray daily. Uh, put clear scriptures per area that you want me to see my hand in. Put, put scriptures. Fill the, your, 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 create a war room in your, in, your, in your garage and put scriptures, this, 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 and I want you to pray daily. That's God speaking. He's building a structure that will cause me to thrive. So I need to go to my garage and clean up the car, you know, put it outside, you know, <laughs> and then do what he told me. Area number one, I need to be praying for this. Number two, up to number 10 on my wall. So every time I come in the morning before I run around, I'm praying area one to 10, and I go through it the whole year because God has given me instructions. Stand up and pray daily. So every single one of us should, trace, should track what are the things that God is saying. And they must be written down. We must follow them. We must follow them. Because the enemy of our lives wants us to forget what God said. Because as long as we forget what God said directly to us, we're not going to transform. We're not going to action anything. We'll just keep coming to church again for 12 months and hope by some kind of osmosis um, from high concentration of the anointing of God to low concentration of no anointing in my life, something will happen. And I'm saying God says no. I need to deliberately build your heart to be ready for what I'm about to bless you with. So take note. Pay attention. Work on things I'm going to point. Action them and stay in them and see God come and visit. 
So both of us, come December, we will dance differently. So I'm expecting God to speak from this coming Sunday. Things, probably he's already spoken some of them today. But I'm expecting the Lord to really speak to every single one of us, starting with me. Things he wants to build in my heart. As your pastor, you know, and my house and my family. Things God wants to build deliberately, how our lives must be according to the word of God. One other powerful statement is that, for me, not for you, I can never build the purposes of God at this level if I can't build them in my house. These two things are connected. And that is the same with my leadership. The Bible says a man who should uh, be a bishop must be a man who manages his household well. You see that connection? To be a bishop here, Mo, God says I must first manage my house well. Then I can build this house. So for me, I need to make that connection very clearly. The success of my standing here is going to be the success of my operating in my house. I need to get that order in, that structure in order. The family structure must be in order according to the word of God. According to the word of God. I to put the structure of my husbandship to my wife here. And I find myself missing certain things. I need grace to align very quickly. Lest the enemy attack that area and destroy me. Amen. So it does with our individual relationship with God. If we put the structure of relating with God on our left and look at our behavior, if certain areas are not in order, we know those are the areas the devil will attack all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. One of them is prayerlessness. If people are not praying, you know the enemy is on your case because he knows we're spiritually not strong because we don't pray. So he'll keep on coming that way and attack an area that can only be sustained by prayer because he knows we're not praying, so we'll always fail in that. So we can't uh, do any other way but to have a complete structure in God. I would love to give you a church where you just don't care about how you live as long as you enjoy yourself. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And I'm sure those kind of churches are nice. Where you just go to church and enjoy yourself and go back and live whichever way you choose. You understand that? And then Sunday you are back with a nice dress coat. Enjoy church and go home and do as you please. Unfortunately, that's not why God called you and saved you. God called you to build a particular life inside you, not a general Christian life. God called each one of us so he could build a particular structure that will fit your place in God. Just you fitting in the will of God. So we, may we say yes to be built by God. You know, it's not your average Christian life. It's, it's just an amazing and a beautiful life to walk with the power of God when he builds us. So we thank God for that. Amen. So may the Lord really give us sight. May the Lord help us walk, see how to walk with him so that we don't have to scream blessings and nothing happens. Year after year, bless you, bless you, and nothing happens. First, before the blessing come, structure must be revamped, overhauled. Some of our structures need to be broken completely. God has to build a new heart from scratch. Then we will see the arriving of God in its power and beauty. So Father, we are grateful. Your word is life. Let it do what it came to do. You said it will never return unto you void. It will accomplish the purpose for which you had sent the word. Let it build my heart. Let it build my family. Let it build KCA. Let it build everybody. Let it build these children of God who are hearing 
the word today so we can stand and walk with you in a powerful way in the new season. We give a praise, we give a glory in Jesus' name. Amen.